close your eyes. 603 score and 6. 603 score and 6. 603 score and 6. The obvious question is, okay, you've been a senior CIA officer, and uh, do you believe this? Yes, I believe this. Uh, however, let me clarify that 90% of the people in CIA are good people trapped in a bad system, and there are at least seven CIAs, okay? So CIA is not a monolithic organization. Also, when we, against the orders of President Truman, when Alan Dulles brought in all the Nazi scientists and so forth, they went to two places. They went to CIA and they went to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, which in our world we call it not a space agency. <laughs> and as Kathy O'Brien has said so clearly, that's where the bulk of the mind control has been done. Are you willing to sacrifice everything in your life to stand up for what's right? And do you like being liked? Because you won't be if you stand up for the truth. How we analyze information, our belief in information, and then our utter belief in taking in new information, and just because we don't want to believe it, we pretend that it can't be true, emotionally, is hurting us as a country. They're playing us left to right, right to left, every single day. I need to be open to information, to know exactly how Truman Show, this Truman Show really is. Oh, honey, almost everything has been a conspiracy of people getting together to conspire. And it's deep, it goes deeper than most people can even fathom. And I know it rocks people's world. So we have a thinking problem going on in America. I realize that people just want to believe what they believe, and they don't want to be nudged in a direction that they are not willing to look at or willing to, abs to take in the information. 50s and 60s changed so drastically, completely unnatural to any other decade or two decades in history. How did that happen? It was a decade after the infiltration into the media, the Washington Post, and psychological operations. The intelligence agencies never really were going to do very, very much work on foreign ground. Most of the work they did was right here. Do you feel played yet? Just a little. NASA was called NACA to start with. We got the Nazi scientists over here from World War II, and then all of a sudden we got this program that went from planes in the NACA, okay, to NASA, space. Very interesting time. And isn't it interesting that, uh, that it was named after Greek gods, Apollo, Artemis? <laughs> Did anyone ever wonder about that and why that was the case? It was really, really interesting. Greek mythology was used as a means to explain the environment in which humankind lived, the natural phenomena that witnessed in the passing of time of the days and months and the seasons. Greek myths were connected to religion, but explained the origin and the lives of the gods, so it wasn't actually God, it's godless. And what it is, is 12 basic gods are the reason for the creation of Mother Earth, who I apparently spit us out, I don't know, I guess we don't have a creator, Mother Earth did it. Anyway, it was a reason to describe all of that and to put the heavyweight on nature and on the environment as the creation of us and the creation of all things. And there's so much about NASA that has never added up. People are finally starting to figure it out. They're finally starting to figure out what a money laundering scheme this has been for such a long time. And then the billionaires, they all have the exact same interest. I've always found that kind of funny. The high profile billionaires all putting their money into space. Maybe it's a money laundering operation that works both ways. You know, when I ask these questions about NASA, and I realized how many people were involved at, at Langley that brought us NASA, and uh, the German scientists involved that were full on Nazis that brought us NASA, 
And then all of a sudden, um, we go to the moon and then we can't go back for 50 years and we still can't go back. So they're offering their little their little chip is, you know, well, we're going to we're going to land something on the moon. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. And I wish people would actually really look into it. Why do we fear so much? Why is it so hard for us to break away from the pack and display any courage at all? When you speak out about the truth, the truth resonates. It has a power. It has an ability to settle in your soul and you can't unknow it. This is where you and I and all of those listening could actually change the world because it doesn't take very many people to change thought. It takes a small army. It always has in the past taken a small group of people to change things. Just that people don't want to be called crazy and they don't want people not to like them. That's what's sad. Way too many lies, not enough questions, not enough questions that we're asking. It's just the state of where we're at, I think, intellectually in this country. There's a reason you know what you know. And there's a reason that the group is probably always going to be very small that actually understand what's happening and must lead. We have to lead. Not everybody can be a robot polisher. We're lacking curiosity in this country. We are lacking the ability to ask questions and to find out which, what fakeries are among us. Use your voice while you can. There's nothing to be afraid of. So if things go crazy, why don't they just go up? Maybe because they can't. Lexi, tell us something interesting. OK. The Earth is flat and a witch stole his pants. Wake up. Wake up, wake up. Send this message to Prince Constantine. Flat Earth has long been denigrated, derided, and disparaged as being the most crackpot of all conspiracy theories, marginalized, mocked, and ridiculed for centuries as being an ignorant, ancient, unscientific worldview. But the facts of the matter are far from what you have been told. When thoroughly examined and diligently researched with an open mind, any skeptical, critical thinker will find it is actually the tilting, wobbling, spinning spaceball Earth promoted by NASA and taught in schools that is truly ridiculous and unscientific. Hey man, yeah, we're looking flat. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. This world is not what you think it is. This world is not what you think it is. Go, go. Hi, all, and welcome back to the Sovereignty Series. I am here today with Amanda Vollmer, and this is a long overdue discussion. I have been thinking about bringing her on for some time now, and there were so many different topics that I could ask her about. Many in the realm of health and medicine, alternative history, of course, around germ theory. And what I have chosen to spotlight today is the topic of cosmology, and it's really so that we can enjoy Amanda's mind for this hour and really be taken on a tour of what the landscape of awakening can look like in this very controversial realm that has all of the characteristics and features that the other advocacies that I have publicly represented share. So I think where we're going to dive in is the sort of seminal moments in Amanda's life that began to awaken her to this question, you know, is reality, is the nature of this place <laughs> that we live, what we have been told? And, you know, I'll end this introduction just by saying that Amanda is absolutely one of the very few, like one hand of people that afford me this feeling of being able to like relax <laughs> because I know that she has the intellectual wheel, you know, and as I work with the part of me that needs to be the expert and allow that part to relax a bit, it's, it's people like Amanda that have really created this like lovely soft <laughs> fabric for me to, you know, lay back into because I just so value how it is that she thinks and the depth to which she explores. Right. So, and we'll probably talk about this at some point 
today, but, you know, she introduced me to this concept of the double cross, right? And I think about it all the time, right? So people ask this, you know, they question reality, but then there's like another question to ask. And there's probably even another one, another one beneath that. And the folks who can, you know, dig that deep, begin to create a very beautiful reality. You know, that's what I have found is that when we ask deep enough questions, we come to, to some place that feels really good. And if you just start to scratch the surface and you ask like the preliminary questions and you come up with like the first conspiracy theory layer, you kind of get arrested in the same fear state that you might've been in had you, you know, swallowed the hook from the beginning. So she's really one of the, in my opinion, great thought leaders in, in this realm. So with that, welcome, Amanda. I'm excited to be here with you. Thank you, Kelly. Definitely long overdue. And I'm really happy we can sit down and open up this Pandora's box of, you know, information and really challenge because this realm to me is a place of challenge and growth and lessons and some sort of individuation experience that, you know, tests us at every corner. And, you know, this topic is really a hot button for a lot of people. But when we have controversy, then we have opportunity as well, because we can now present other materials like, oh, do you understand what logical fallacies are, for example, or and what's happening to your emotions when you're confronted with something that challenges your current belief system? How do you handle that? And how do you look to the information in an unbiased way so that you can formulate new opinions or new ideas? And it's contentious and uh, there'll be people, I'm sure, in comments and things that will say, you know, maybe not very nice things of our conversation. And that's okay. I mean, you're, you, if we w didn't do anything, then where would we be if we let that stop us? You know, because sometimes when we're in the public eye, it can be very harsh, the judgments and the condemnation. But that's really the same syndrome I'm seeing when people are so resistant to looking at new information or having other ideas about, you know, what could be going on in this reality. And we're really just trying to get to the truth here. That's really the goal. That's my goal. I just want to understand and know, and I don't like to be lied to. I don't like, like to be tricked. And, and my whole journey has been about finding that out. I want to know at least as much as I can know in this place. And that's what this cosmology discussion is about. And you know, I don't like certain terms that have gotten out there, like flat earth even, like that term flat earth has become almost weaponized and I've steer, I'm have steer, i steering far away from it. I like true earth or corrected cosmology or real earth, these sorts of terms, because the, we've been shrouded in all these lies, layers and layers of lies, and we're peeling them back and peeling them back and we don't need to really be fixed on a label or on a naming system just yet. We're still uncovering layers here, so we don't need to get so stuck on semantics. We're really looking at evidence and we are looking at logic and we are also trying to understand the human mind and when it comes to cult programming, brainwashing, um, how the masses think and work and what's really been going on for a long time in correcting our history. And it's very important. People will say, oh, it's why do you bother with this, Amanda? You should stick to your lane. I, you probably get that a lot too. Yes. Like, why, why are you dancing, Kelly? You should <laughs> stick to your lane, Kelly. You know, like this sort of thing. And it's because they're confronted with something uncomfortable in themselves, right? And they're just projecting it outward. And it's no different that with any of these things. It's all their own internal workings. And when we're finding our own strength, which is, I think, the point of a lot of this, we need to take responsibility for what we're feeling and be adults, right? Because children will do that. They'll blast out. And we're supposed to teach children how <laughs> to formulate their own thoughts, be a critical thinker, you know, question authority, question what you think you know, question what you were told by your teachers, these sorts of things. I teach my child that. I'm sure you teach your babes that too. You know, this is how we learn. And this is how we're going to be better when we are adults and take self-responsibility for our emotions and our feelings and our beliefs and all those things. So I'm very tender with this topic because I personally don't need any more <laughs> backlash. You know, I'm not, it's not like I'm inviting it. I'm just stating that 
I've gone through this process. It's been many years now for me, 2016, 17 is when I woke up to a lot of lies, like there aren't any viruses. <laughs> That's one of the biggest ones for me. And then I, after that is when the true earth cosmology hit me and I realized, no, this really, okay. And I went through a lot of the cognitive dissonance that a lot, I'm not immune to it. I mean, there are people who are like, oh yeah, that, oh, they'll click with it. But that wasn't me. I was severely indoctrinated too. I went, <laughs> I'm a scientist trained. Okay. You have to understand when you think that you know that this is true, you don't let in the other thoughts. You don't let in the other information. And then a good friend says to me, oh, you're wrong. <clears throat> but all the things you thought you knew for, you know, 30, 40 years, oh, well, you're something wrong with you because that can't be right because I can't be wrong. And it just comes down to that attachment to the belief that the ego adheres to and you don't want to change it because it does feel uncomfortable or feels like almost like a death to the self, a death to or a betrayal of the self. Like I liked Star Trek. I watched all the Star Trek. I have memories and emotions of watching Star Trek with my father that are that I cherish. How dare you, you know, make me question my own happy memories and taint them or tarnish them with that, you know, all these things. So that's why I, am, I do tread delicately with it. I definitely don't shy away from talking about it, but I don't put it in people's face because there's a timing. There really is a timing. And I learned that the hard way. I'm sure you've had experiences of you're too soon <laughs> with something really big, right? So, you know, that, so my presentation is really light and it's really just me talking through some of my experiences and the things that I know, and I've done the deep work on that are just absolutely non-fact based. And here are the facts of where we live. And if people can just take a few of those and run with them, or maybe it'll be a niggling in their mind, you know, after like, yeah, that's sitting with me. I'm going to go do a deep dive on it because I'll tell you right now, People watching this, they cannot form an opinion yet. So they come in. The best way is to come in, blank slate, open-minded, interesting, interested or not, doesn't matter. But if you're interested, just try, you know, to just to spend what you think you know at this point and come in with an open mind and an open heart and just allow for the information to be there and watch triggers. So when triggers come up, go, oh, there it is. Catch one. And the more you catch your triggers, then you realize, oh, that's ego trigger. That's ego trigger. That's cognitive dissonance. Cool. I st you still feel it, but you don't have to react to it and blast it over people. And because you don't know, you can't form an opinion. So there aren't any really much there. There's no opinion that you can say, oh, well, that's because, you know, that's crap. Well, we all know the globe model. We all grew up with it. Okay. You don't need to teach us about the ball. In fact, most people don't even know that model, really. If you question them on the details of the model of the Earth being a ball floating in space, you know, moving hundreds of thousands of miles, you know, rapidly and spinning and turning and all this kind of stuff, they don't know those details. They just know the images and they just know what their, you know, grade school teacher told them. So they don't even know their own model. So you still can't even form an opinion. So that's where I see a lot of error being made with people when they react. They say no, but they don't have evidence. So I'll present some of that information today. I love it. I love it. You speak my language. Let's do it. Okay. All right. I titled this Corrected Cosmology and really it's not, it's not totally, I mean, <laughs> there's PhD papers. Like this is a massive topic. People have to understand this. Okay. You can't expect an hour presentation to really do it true full justice. I'm what I'm trying to do here. And when I was formulating this, I thought here's some glaring pieces of the puzzle that people need to start asking questions about. That's really all I'm doing here. But I do want to start with kind of my process a little bit. And of course we know the old burden of proof reversal is done all the time where they say, oh, well, you say this earth is flatter that we don't live on a ball. Where is your proof? But this is a burden of proof reversal because if you're trying to make a claim and the claim is actually that the there's a round earth, a ball earth, that's what the, that's the proof. The proof needs to be there. That's where we start. Not 
going to truth and saying that needs to be proved. The truth, it just comes to light. It doesn't need the proof so much as these wild claims because they are extraordinary. The baller theory and the modeling is all extraordinary. And the, and so the proof is also equally extraordinary and out, out of control, outrageous and manufactured through maths and through modeling that have not been proven to be true. So that, so when people say prove it to me, that's actually a lo logical fallacy. It's like, no, you ex please explain your ball model <laughs> to me because that was the one manufactured. One of the things that people don't really realize is they trick you with cameras. I mean, they trick you with CGI and with cameras and a bendy, a bendy camera needs to be removed from the debate. Like you can't just say it's a ball because you use a bendy camera. We explore how fisheye lenses will cause straight lines to curve when they are near the edges and how it may allow a straight line to remain straight if it is going through the center. This is an experiment anyone can do for as little as a dollar in a cell phone. In this video, we will show some high altitude balloon videos that use fisheye lenses compared with a few that do not followed by a clip of the Red Bull jump that shows a good example of movement of the camera to confirm a fisheye lens was being used. This is a CGI image. This is a fake image. I don't know what happened here <laughs> with why or how they manufactured this because it doesn't make a lot of sense, but there is no ISS in space. For one, people think that hunk of junk is floating around up there. Meanwhile, what did I just hear yesterday? It was some, oh yes, it was the other day someone had said a scientist has done a test on a small particle, like a, a the end of a rubber eraser. If that were to hit something in space, what kind of damage it would do? And it was this huge metal crater that he had shown that what would have hap would happen in space, right? But we don't hear these terrible stories in the IS of, you know, holes and explosions and, you know, how dangerous that would be, how much space junk apparently is supposed to be out there and all sorts of stuff. We, we don't get any of that. We don't get satellites falling to earth, pummeling to earth, crashing into people with where supposedly all of this junk up here. I mean, people have to start thinking. And this is done underwater and CGI. It's very easy to do. We've caught them using green screens, screens many times, caught them using wires so that they look like they flip in space. And all they do is like brush their teeth, pee in a tube. This is their experiments up there. This is what we pay them billions of dollars to do to play guitar in space. They're clowns. Oh, would you look at this? Yeah, well, would you look at that? Yeah, the, oh my gosh, just look at it. Just look at it. <laughs> Just look at it. Yeah, well. What the heck is that? <laughs> and they're all high level Masons, all of them. So people are just glamorized. They're just, they can't see. They, they've been lied to so much. They don't know what's up and what's down, literally. And this is a model that they use for a lot of these, you know, rocket shows. And it's easy to fake. They've been... <laughs> I don't think people realize that you can compartmentalize a huge institution. The, a lot of the low-level people that work for these space agencies, they think space is real too. They're not in on the scam. When you compartmentalize the information, you only get need-to-know basis data. You don't see the whole enchilada only by accident. And there are people who do find out and leave disgusted, you know, knowing what this cult is. This is one of the things I, you know, I'd like to see. Show me upside down people. Show me upside down buildings. Show me upside down boats and planes and things. Because, hey, if we are so high tech, you should be able to zoom out any one of those satellites or whatever you're sent. You sent something to Mars, you say? Well, then turn the camera damn well around and show and zoom in and show me some damn people walking upside down. But I don't see any of that. Nobody does that. There's no 24-7 image of the spinning ball that's like, you should have a channel where you're like, oh, I just feel like looking at the earth move today. Just type it in like, like those fireplace, you know, YouTube channels. <laughs> oh, I just feel like watching the earth slowly rotate. Oh, look at that. No, they can't do that. If they did anything like that, it would be all CGI anyway. But up to this date, they don't do these things because the gig is up. I'm still working on this slide really, but 
you, there is no measured curve. The, every chance, every experiment trying to measure a curve has failed. Okay. Even in engineering, I remember when I was in school, when I was in university, we had, I had to do a lot of math. Oh my gosh. And so in one of the, I think it was an algebra class and I caught this weird proof that it added in a curvature calculation for bridge, I think. But then when you looked at the math, it took it out again at the end of the equation. And I thought, well, why would you add it and then take it out? That doesn't make sense. Don't you want the curve to be there for your manufacturing of your, of your buildings or your, you know, I don't get it. Why would you do? And that was a clue. That was a little, my, my spiritual teacher would say, file that. <laughs> You'll need that for later, right? So that was one of those things that later on when I was studying, I went back and went, oh yeah. And I went and I found a lot of those books and there's, it's all added into trick. There's nothing that's used. Airplanes don't use a, a curvature. They fly straight all the way through. There's just no measurable curve. Anyway, guys, there are so many, um, facts that it's flat i mean think about it like think about it like okay i guys you don't even know you don't even know i think i am a what do they call it um a flat i think they call it a flat earther millie when you were 14 years old you said on a tiktok live that you thought the earth was flat hmm. unfortunately yes i did do you still believe this? <laughs> no. You're telling the truth. Although I've never seen, like the the, you know, you know when you're on a plane, sometimes you can see it, the curve. I've not seen that yet. You've seen satellite pictures, right? Satellite I I pictures. have, I have, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Judd. Final question. At any point, did you lie during this interview and we didn't catch you? Yes. She's telling the truth. It's, on, it's the craziest thing ever. Flat Earth is the craziest thing, but guess what, dude? It's fucking flat, dude. And everyone is gonna <laughs> find out eventually. It's off. No one ever gets into Flat Earth and then turns back. You don't. It's like Santa Claus. When you find out Santa Claus is in real, people don't go back and say, you know what? I, I'm, I, I'm starting to believe in Santa Claus again. No, it's the same fucking thing, dude. Water is level. That's the science of water. Everyone's talking about science.
to look at the mountains in the distance, the faint ones. Oh my God. Wow. That is incredible, folks. Whoa. Whoa. Look at all those peaks. Oh my God. We are around Mount Shasta and in the foreground we see those uh, lakes right there. I think that's a clear lake reservoir uh, right here. The double lake. I think that's clear lake reservoir. And then right in front of this first mountain range is Goose Lake. Uh, and then there's a bunch of mountain ranges that superimpose themselves in Nevada and then we reach into Utah um, but there's a lot of mountain ranges that superimpose in front of each other but then in that darkness above we see even farther oh my god this is incredible look at that look at that those faint I don't think those are clouds, to be honest. I've, uh, I've enhanced the photos and their mountain peaks. I think we're looking into Colorado. It just blew me away. But there's also clouds, to be certain. Wow. This is crazy. Yeah, this is incredible. So we're flying at about 35,000 feet, as you can see here. Zooming out quite a bit into the distance, right over Goose Lake in front of this mountain range. Oh, look at that. This is crazy. See, there's cloud cover too, but way above the clear mountain ranges which overlap. Look at that. See, right there. Oh my god, those are mountains. Wait, I gotta lift the camera a little bit. Come on, up, up, up. Yeah, right there. Oh my god. Wow. Yeah, so um, I've done some analysis which indicates those are pretty far. See, so there's even farther ones there. As good as infrared is, uh, after a while, it also gets attenuated, but it extends the range greatly. And seeing this zone right here, there is no precipitation, so we were able to pierce as far as we could. Yeah, that just blew me away. Whew. So yeah, I think... Right about here we must have crossed. Oh, you can see Klamath Falls in the lower left. That's Klamath Falls uh, Lake there. Let's zoom out one more time. Look at that. Man. Yeah, when we get to the shallow angles, all these mountain ranges, they just overlap. Ding, 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 ding. And way in the distance, the taller mountain just obscure the ones in the back. See, there's three mountain ranges in the top layer. The dark one, light one, and then to the left, another one. And then behind them, even more. So, yeah, only 3D analysis can uh, really extract that. Here I'm looking forward over Oregon and look at all the peaks. Wow, look at that. All these peaks in Oregon, I'll um, have a separate video. I've climbed uh, Mount Hood and I've looked back. Just incredible. It's not okay to think that the Earth is flat. Is the Earth flat or round? It's round. Okay, now let's see. How do we go about proving that? Earth, throughout its life, even when it formed, it was spinning. And it got a little wider at the equator than it does at the pole. So it's not actually a sphere, it's an it's oblate, and officially it's an oblate spheroid. That's what we call it. But not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator. A little chubbier. Chubby's a good way. It's like pear-shaped.
Everybody's saying the earth is not flat. How do you know? Because did you know? Oh no, I'm not even going to say it because I'm probably going to be shut down on Instagram or something. The stars, they stay the same. I mean, that was one of the things where I was like, yeah, I mean, I like studying astrology. I was always into astrology since a child. And that's pretty stable stuff. We have thousands of years here. Not a single star's changed positions, minus the wandering stars, which we call planets. They're, we're supposedly going really fast through a lot of space in, in a short amount of time, but not even close. Our, our stars are not changing. We have ancient star maps that are accurate to this day. And the Astro Lab is an ancient navigational tool that you just can't even use if you're traveling and moving and bobbling about. It's impossible. And of course, what do people say? Oh, because, but gravity, that's, that's every, when people are struggling through this, they always throw the gravity thing out. But gravity is a lie. It doesn't actually exist. And that's been well proven if you've studied, if you've looked and you read and you understand, that's not real. And that was made up and manufactured in mainly in order to remove ether from the picture. The Masonic fraud, Einstein, was part of that. He was the, part of what, if he even did it at all, because they're all puppet actors. So they, those are the front faces, but did he really actually do all that? We don't, I don't know. I can't go back and prove that. I know they're massive liars, so why would I believe any of it? I still don't trust that he was even smart <laughs> at this point, you know? So I, so he, had to remove ether from the equation in order to get theory of relativity to work, in order to get these gravity calculations corrected. So that's not scientific. It's not scientific to remove things we know exist to fit your theories. That's like shoehorning a big foot to a small shoe. You can't just do that. That's not scientific. It's not science. It's scientism. So they put it in our face. This is when you have eyes to see they put it in our face. They All of these companies that are all linked to the major controlling families that own all the media, that put all of the propaganda out to the people, they put it right there. Look, dome, dome, firmament, firmament, dome. I don't know how much more domey you need to be, but they do disclose it because they have to because there are laws in this place spiritual laws in this place and one of them is about your free will and you have to agree to it even if it's tricked even if it's subtle you have to give your consent and this is how they get away with it through their entertainment systems there has to be a barrier okay scientifically we know this i mean basic physics class in grade school which show you, you have to have, if you have a positive pressure system next to, adjacent to a negative pressure system, so Earth's atmosphere to space, how does that work without a physical barrier? They've tried all sorts of ways to try to explain this, and it's ridiculous. And never has it been shown in actual physics to be so. You must have a, a boundary in between the two, period. And you can't just even, if you opened a little bit of that, there would be an explosion, okay? <laughs> it's very simple. These are very simple things to think through and understand. A child comes around. My child understands it, you know? She's not indoctrinated. So guess what? It's very easy for her. I was like, she's like, yeah, duh, you know? But when you've got the propaganda running, you're not like, oh, yeah, duh. You're like, no, I want my illusions. I want, I know, I can't be. I don't want to do that work, right? But Unfortunately, if you do want to know, you're going to have to put in the work and effort. Um, so in physics, when oppose, opposite pressure systems converge and homogenize, we call this equilibrium. So in a real, testable, repeatable experiment, it's impossible without a physical barrier to contain or separate opposing pressure system. Think air duster. Only vacuum can even get remotely close to that on the Earth is like 10 to the negative 7, I think. And it takes like immensely thick concrete walls with rebar and it still doesn't really work. 
requires insane maintenance. Um, but even in that situation, if you had a pressurized system, certainly like 14.7 PSI at the surface, right? It's going to violently fill the available space because entropy always increases. So with all natural systems, entropy increases, therefore the amount of usable energy decreases. It's going to fill the available space, violently seeking equilibrium. And so if we actually had a pressurized system on the earth and it was encompassed by this ever expanding vacuum of space, the gas would violently fill the available space. It has infinite space to fill. So you, according to the second law of thermodynamics, you literally could not have this gas pressure system we have on the earth that keeps us alive inside of a vacuum of 10 to the negative 17 torque. It could not be adjacent to that. It violates the second law of thermodynamics, which is the most indisputable and agreed upon natural law, which isn't a theory, it's just observation. It's a natural law. So it's a major glow problem. atmosphere here on earth is like the thinness of a razor blade compared to a million miles or more billion miles that's how vast this vacuum is now they want us to believe that we could have atmospheric pressure gas pressure sitting here in amongst this vacuum I mean this is one of the simplest debunks and it's really uh, ridiculous that they you know, I mean, I guess people haven't challenged it. You know, people have been busy living their lives and working, but it's being challenged now and it's being obliterated, really, the spinning ball. And really one of the easiest ones is this. As I look into the sky, there's no way that's a vacuum. How can you have a vacuum next to pressure? I mean, first of all, you could argue that you need uh, a container, first of all, to have gas pressure. But they're saying there is no container. There's no barrier between us and the vacuum. Do you know how strong the vacuum of space would be? You know, NASA has a vacuum chamber and they say the walls are six to eight feet thick. All right, if you don't have six to eight feet thick walls, you may see this. Take these big tanker train cars. They suck the air out of this and, and they implode because the air is trying to get to the vacuum. They're creating a vacuum inside, right? So you need to have those six to eight foot thick walls that would separate us from the vacuum. But, but there is no such thing. They take rockets and they supposedly fly up into space. Actually, they're just, you know, going out over the ocean and dunking the parts in the ocean and the plane, or the whatever they're shooting up there goes nowhere. But they, they're telling us that's what's happening, but you'd have to have a barrier for us to keep our gas pressure because look at, look at how hard the pressure wants to go fill that empty space, right? So they do six to eight foot thick walls to keep their little vacuum chamber from imploding. And these tank cars, you can see them implode. That's the power of the vacuum next to air pressure. And that's it. Clearly, NASA needs six to eight foot thick walls to keep their little uh, building there from imploding. You can see these tank cars implode. They don't have six to eight foot thick walls. So this is what happens when you have a vacuum next to gas pressure or, or atmospheric pressure or air pressure like we have here on Earth. So right there, busted. It's not real. Simple debunk. So really, you can test at home. And that's what I did when I started waking up. I'm like, okay, first of all, first I went, I'm going to prove him wrong. This is what a lot of people, a lot of us do. I am going to go through all the globe proofs and I'm going to show that he is wrong. I'm going to go through every one of their claims and I'm going to dismiss each claim. 
And that's what woke me up <laughs> because as I'm working through this, I'm like, okay, well, that, you're right. Okay, you got you got something here. That okay, I'll park that. I'll come back to that. And then, but then another one, I'm like, oh yeah, that's a good point too. I don't even know how. Oh, and this started happening where I'm like, damn, I'm getting stuck when I'm trying to prove it. What's happening to me right now? <laughs> and you really do have to have enough strength of mind to, to come at it because it's a strange experience. You, everyone will go through it in their different way. But for me, it was like a lifting of some sort of fog out, out of my mind and I had to be gentle with myself through it. It took some time for me to let that lift. And then I apologized to my friend. I said, wow, okay, I can't prove this stuff. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy a P900 cam, you know, I'm, I bought an icon camera. I bought a high quality camera. Okay. Zoom, zoom camera. I bought, I went, I traveled, I went up every high peak I could get. I went to Manitoba and I, they have the needle in the middle of Winnipeg where it's the highest point, I think in all of North America. I am going to see this. I got to see this. I got to understand this myself. I would go on long roads when in the westerly sun and watch the sun not set, but move farther and farther away from me, move away from me. And I'm like, it's not setting. It's not going underneath thing at all. Wait a second. And alongside my drive, I see telephone poles, telephone poles, right? And what happens? They converge at the vanishing point at the end of the road. And I can't see past that point. But what does it look like? It looks like it's going down, but it's not. It's a perception thing. It's the way in which we see. And trained as an artist, because that was really what my initial vocation was going to be, I knew, I, excuse me, I understood perspective. I understood that, you know, these shapes, the way that our eye sees things, it, it's matters to the physics in which we are seeing. And so I knew you can't see forever. People say, oh, why can't I see all the way to Africa then? Well, because that's ridiculous. You do understand that's ridiculous, right? <laughs> I mean, unless you're Superman or something, I don't think that's quite possible. There, we do have a limit to our vision, right? I mean, a lot of the reactions that come are really easy to bat away because they're just emotional reactions and they're not very logical. When I, <laughs> when I was young, you know, and in school, like most people, you hear, um, they start telling you about the heliocentric model and what it is and everything. And these things, a couple of things always really bothered me about it the most. The first was, you know, what we've been, which has been a big subject in Flat Earth here recently is how do we have a pressurized system next to an infinite vacuum without a barrier? Like, how does that work? It's, it never made sense to me in school. Um, that one always bothered me. I had to just let it go. All right, let's try another pretty simple process. Let's just take a gas, in some volume, V, and over here is gonna be vacuum, V equal volume, and we're gonna remove the barrier. You know what's gonna happen spontaneously, right? The gas is gonna fill the available volume once it's once it becomes available, right? You know what's gonna happen spontaneously, right? The gas is gonna fill the available volume once, it's, once it becomes available. So after Flat Earth, of course, and looking into it more, you know, I, I tend to think that this is more what our, what our um, Earth looks like. It's not correct, obviously. But to me, it makes sense that we would be living in an enclosed system. I mean, if you, if you, have a pet or anything you know you make them what do you do you first you make them a nice little habitat something that's going to protect them from anything that could possibly come from the outside right so i feel like this is probably our habitat there is a firmament or dome encasing our flat plane the firmament is described in the bible's creation narrative then god said let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters in Egyptian mythology, Newt is the goddess of the sky. She is seen star-covered, arching over the earth, representing its dome. In Greek mythology, Uranus was the primeval god of the sky. The Greeks imagined the sky as a solid dome of brass, whose edges descended to rest upon the outermost limits of the flat earth. Uranus was the literal sky, and Gaia the earth. In the Roman era, he was often depicted as Eon, god of eternal time in the form of a man holding the zodiac wheel, standing above Gaia. 
The Hebrews believed the sky was a solid dome. They called this solid vault of heaven the Rakia, with the sun, moon, and stars beneath. In Indian mythology, the dome is called Brahmanda. This is the structure of the world according to Finnish mythology, showing a dome with the stars projected onto it. In the aboriginal conception of the world, the earth was circular and flat, covered by the dome of the sky, which stretched out to the horizon. And there have been many ancient artifacts found, which the mainstream has called stone handbags. But as you can see, there's no area to even carry anything. These were not handbags. They're artistic depictions of the dome here on Flat Earth. So many ancient peoples knew about this dome and wove it into their worldview. The elite would have us believe that these are just made-up cosmologies, invented by peoples who were too scientifically ignorant to understand reality. But there is no coincidence that the same description of a flat earth and dome is so common. These cultures around the world had special knowledge about the nature of this place we are living in. To assume that you've got a sky vacuum and therefore not require a justification for its violation of that particular law, that would be an entropy increase or standard gas law. The volume that you would calculate it with would be the volume of space the gas has to fill. And if the sky was a vacuum, that would be an availability of volume for the gas we breathe to fill. And fill it it must, that's what gas does, it expands in all directions. So the gas we're breathing, which is at pressure, would fill the sky vacuum. Now their response is often to say, well we have a gas pressure gradient, which is merely a delta of the original question and assertion when you've got a sky vacuum belief. How can you have gas pressure in the first instance without a container? And they would say, well, a delta of gas pressure, gas pressure gradient is something we experience. But well, how did you achieve the gas pressure in the first place without containment? And the answer is you can't. It stands directly in violation of several natural laws. Without the container, there can be no pressure. Therefore, if the sky was a vacuum, as asserted in the heliocentric rhetoric, then the gas we breathe would fill the space. Outer space, claimed to be a vacuum, is fake. Therefore, any claims from that claim to be sky vacuum are automatically fake. Including, but not limited to, pictures of Earth from space. The region is fake, second law of thermodynamics violation, Therefore, the pictures claimed to have come from the fake region are also fake. Orbits in a sky vacuum, which is also a begging the question fallacy, which I won't detail now, is claimed to take place in a fake place called space. Therefore, automatically fake. Everyone, please stop what you're doing and listen. This is not a drill. Stop the truck! Stop! Oh God, in the house, in the house! I can't tell you if what happened is an act of terror or an act of God. Where the hell did it come from? No idea. Open fire! Get people trapped in here! <laughs> What are you telling us we're trapped like rats? Stop! To prevent your poisons from spreading, your government has sealed you all within this dome. Go, run! Whatever it is. It cut off all our roads. It's not just the roads, the whole town. Who's hurt? Raise your hands. Oh. Without the attitude. Our best guess puts the dome at 20,000 feet, sir. Did he just call it a dome? You think we might be stuck in here a while? I think that even if what's wrong suddenly becomes right, the army's just gonna quarantine this place. I want roving death squads around the perimeter 24-7. I want 10,000 tough guys. Should we tell them the truth? an urgent note from the president. It says to release this town immediately. Why is it written on a leaf? What ruthless madmen could have done this to us? Why Chester's mouth? 
Why us? Maybe we're being punished. We're all on the same side. Let's see who your friends are and who isn't. Oh, it's a good pig. I, I can't hear you. Looks like we're stuck in a giant fishbowl. I used to have fish, but then one of them got sick, and the other one ate him. It's amazing no one was hurt. Bye, everybody. Earth is not a closed system. Gas dome. The Earth is a closed system. Glass dome. Earth is not a closed system. Gas dome. The Earth is a closed system. Glass dome. Earth is not a closed system. Gas dome. The Earth is a closed system. Glass dome. Get it? Glass dome. Gas dome. Are you with me? You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. This was what I did. I basically rose up as high as I could, and I went in airplanes. I did everything. And by the way, they curve a lot of the windows in airplanes. So people, when you believe it's round, you see it round because you're overlaying your belief onto the reality. So that little bit of curve in the window is all it takes. You go, yeah, it must be round. But they're not really thinking because if they look, just looked out the window for a second, first of all, it's flat as shit, but secondly, it's risen. Like if you take a picture from a can from a, the airplane window, it's come up. The horizon has come up. This, okay, I got to tell you, it's actually a bit embarrassing. I can, I didn't understand this proof. I didn't get, I didn't understand what, see, like the words that people were telling me. What are you saying the horizon rises to meet my eyes? What do you, what are you freaking talking about? I don't understand. Like I couldn't, it's like my brain was so blocked. Because I think it was such an important proof for me to awaken. I blocked it so hard that I didn't even understand the words that, and this is someone with degrees and shit, like, and I'm like, what's wrong with me? What? Why can't I understand what is being told to me? And it finally just clicked. Actually, it was Eric Dubé's video where he does a test where he has a balloon. You've probably seen it. It's like a air balloon, right? And there, what it would look like if it was a ball as you rise, you're leaving the ball behind. You're leaving the ball behind. So it's fit going away from you. But if it's not a ball, then as you rise, that it's rising with you because it just expands. It just keeps expanding. So the horizon rises to meet your eyes. Well, finally, when that clicked, I went, oh my, okay. Oh, right. It does. I've tested it. I climb and it's coming with me. Every time I take a photo, it's right there in my center field of view. That means it, that is a hundred percent proof that we're not about Wh whatever anybody says. That is one hundred proof, one hundred percent proof that we are not about because you can't fake that. You can't CGI that shit. All you need to do is go up into you know the restaurants, the rotating restaurants that are in all the cities and stuff. Go. I took my camera and I filmed, and it the you could see the limit of your own eye. It was like a disc. It was as if I could see all the way around as far as my eye would go, which is a limit that is in the shape of a disc. And it was amazing. I was totally, I was emotional. I was, I was what is this place? What, you know, and so what ends up happening is you throw away the lies, <clears throat> excuse me, but you don't know the truth yet. You, you can't. So a lot of people who really get triggered by this information, they'll say, well, what about this or what how did this work then it's like that is not fair to do to somebody who's woken up to lies okay because now you're putting the burden of proof on them again it's just a logical fallacy you can't do that we just know that it's not this we don't know what it is but we know it's definitely not that so and there's so many amazing true earth researchers now that are doing so much amazing work and gathering da data and doing actual science and we're getting there <clears throat> we're getting to that sea change where people are going to have enough data to actually go and put this together a little bit better. So anyone can do this test, just this simple test. It will always rise to your eyes. And this is what I was saying about gravity. So when they remove the ether, now you have gravity. So now you have all these complicated mathematical constructs and things that the normal everyday person could not really conceive of, which is one of their major tricks, right? 
things are billions and gazillions and gazillions, you know, of light years away. And like these astronomical numbers that you can't even get your head around. It doesn't even make any sense, right? It's for fantasy. It's to trap children in the wow factor. So they're addicts of this crap for life. And it's just not so. We don't have these astronomical huge numbers in distance and so forth and in, in gravity and these make-believe ideas. And you have birds and bees that can fly. And then we have water sticking to a ball. How is that? They don't work together. They cancel each other out. I don't care what you say about mass. It, it Gravity is bunk. Okay. And it's been disproven and you can find the information. You can research this. Flat Not a theory that bodies of water always seek and find their own level. Level, level, level. From a pond, lake, or an ocean, the natural physics of water is defined and remain level, level, level. The science of water is it's always level. The earth is 70% water. We should be able to find curvature in the ocean. On the, on land, land is uneven. You really can't, it's unpredictable land. You really can't measure curve correctly. Water is level. That's the science of water. Everyone's talking about science. The only thing that keeps the the ball earth theory uh, together is gravity. That's the yeah. only thing. But gravity's never been proven. Gravity's like, oh, gravity's been proven, look. Gravity, no. <laughs> and gravity, like you pick some up with gravity. No. Try doing that to a helium balloon. Then what? What is that? Helium balloon, an anti-gravity spaceship. <laughs> what about a helium balloon? You can't explain that, can you? Why doesn't that drop? You drop the mic because the mic goes falls because it's more dense than the medium that surrounds it. <laughs> helium balloon is less dense, so it goes up. Anything that's less dense than the medium that surrounds it goes up. Anything that's more dense goes down. You drop a rock size, a rock that you could fit in the palm of your hand, you drop it in the ocean, what happens? It sinks. You drop a, a ball, a tennis ball, what happens? It floats. It floats. It's right there in between the air and the water because it's more dense than the air, but less, the air that's inside the ball is less dense than the water, so it's right there in the middle. It doesn't sink. What is that then? The force, there's a force strong enough to keep the ocean stuck to it, but it's not <laughs> strong enough. It's not strong enough to affect a helium balloon or smoke or birds, birds can do. If there was a force strong enough that kept oceans attached to it, we would be stuck to the fucking ground. <laughs> we would There's be no stuck to the fly. ground. Come on, man, come on. It's really simple. <laughs> Things fall because they're more dense than the medium around it. They rise because they're less dense. Helium balloon, explain that. Explain that, can't explain it. You just, oh, gravity, oh, gra 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 gravity. Uh, I can, I can, in any country, in any city, I can, prove to you that water will always find its level. I could just take a bottle of water and just, I could prove, but no one could ever prove that a ball can, uh, water that can stick to the exterior of a object. Water conforms to the interior of an object. It doesn't conform to the exterior. You can't, you, you can't. Have we ever recreated gravity in, no. in the, science? Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson, he'll even tell you. He's like on, there's a famous video where he goes, well, when you, when, you're, when, you meant, when you talk about gravity, we just, we don't know. What is gravity? You have no idea. Okay, next question. <laughs> wow. No, here's the difference. We can describe gravity. Okay. We can say what it does to other things. We can, we can measure it, predict with it. But when you start asking, like, what it is, I, I, I don't know. The science of water is it's always level. The earth is 70% water. We should be able to find curvature in the ocean. On, the, on land, land is uneven. You really can't, it's unpredictable land. You really can't measure curve correctly. But in the ocean, we're 75% water. There should be, uh, if the water is curved, it, it curves at a certain consistent rate. And they've already figured that out. They figured it out. It, if we're on a ball that's 25,000 miles in circumference, that's what they say. 
That's what uh, school will tell you. That's what the textbooks tell you. 25, we're a ball that's 25,000 miles in circumference. Uh, at, at that size, the, the ball should curve at a rate of eight inches per mile squared, not eight, 16, it's eight and then 32. At that rate, no one disputes that. All the, the, the people battling, there's people that battle flat earth. There's all these battles going on. There's battles everywhere on YouTube. They all, they all know the formula. The formula, and, and with that formula, at 100 miles in the ocean, there should be 6,600 feet, feet so of curvature. That? So, but how do Navy ships target other ships 100 miles away? How do they do that? They take pictures. They, they have a, a, a laser that targets other ships 100 miles away. It's impossible. Water is level. That's the science of water. When we're talking about science, it's flat. It's flat. It's the craziest thing ever. Flat Earth is the craziest thing. But guess what, dude? It's fucking flat, dude. And everyone is gonna <laughs> find out eventually. It's all. No one ever gets into flat Earth and then turns back. You don't. It's like Santa Claus. When you find out Santa Claus is real, people don't go back and say, you know what? I, I'm, I, I'm starting to believe in Santa Claus again. No, it's the same fucking thing, dude. Water is level. That's the science of water. When we're talking about science. Water is level. That's the science of water. When we're talking about science. When I started, it was harder. It was harder to find it. But there are books of yore. There are old texts changing the ball earth all the way through 1800s, 1900s that you can read. And they understood this very easily and explained it quite well. So there, there's lots of resources. So we have, obviously, density and buoyancy now, okay? <clears throat> density, something heavy, something weighted will fall and will go down and things that are light and airy, like all the helium that NASA buys to send up their satellites on balloons, which is what they do. Cause there's, you can't, there's no satellites in space. That's all fake. That floats, that, that rises because it's lighter than the ether, not just air, the ether. And if you think of the ether like water, like a fluid medium, you will understand it better. You will piece it together that, okay, just think of this all around us as water. Okay, just not as drowny. <laughs> it actually doesn't drown you, you know, but it's a lighter fluid. And so that will allow for this idea and understanding of density and buoyancy. So it could be very simply why things float and why things sink are very easy. There is an up and a down. And when you know that, when you know you're not on an angle, like right now from you, Kelly, I should be on some sort of weird angle, right? Like around a sphere so if you're here and i'm here you know we wouldn't be able to see each other but we're angled from each other right now that was one of the proofs that was like wait a second from where i am in my small town to even down to toronto there still should be some curvature here that distance so that means you're telling me that ever so uh, as we go down the street the building should be ever so slightly angled away and away and away I went, that's not right. That doesn't happen. We don't have, we don't have angled buildings leaning. This is crazy. So that was one of the things that also helped me kind of understand that this is not, they're not telling the truth. And so common sense tells us we're not hurtling through space at incredible speeds in multiple contradictory directions in a violent chaotic vacuum, all while butterflies, birds, and bees are immune to such phenomenon. Gravity is nothing more than density and buoyancy think helium blooms. We have so many proofs, it's redundant, really. None of these devices will, most of them don't, would never work on a ball anyway. And the fact that they do work proves that we don't live on a spinning ball. The thermometer is testing the temperature of the moon, actually, the sun and the moon, which are small, that ro they come, they rotate around us. And the moon has its own light. I didn't get those slides added in, but I, there's these if you take a picture of the moon, a good one, like with my P900, I take really crisp pictures. And if you adjust the lighting levels, you know, after you've downloaded it, it's very helpful 
you get new eyes because what you start to see as you darken the image is that the light is emitting from the inside out. It's a glow ball. It's literally a glow ball. It's glowing light from inside of it to outside of it. So all of the pieces that you're seeing that are lighter is coming from inside. It just, it's so clear. It helps you to see that it has its own light and it's actually a cool light. And so people have measured moonlight you know, with a thermometer and it has come up cooler than with no moon. And we already know that I say to my daughter, we go outside and like, oh, Anwen, there's the sun. There's the moon. What's, what phase is the moon in right now? Oh, it's quarter, mommy. Isn't that interesting? Why would the sun be full and shining upon this moon in a quarter fashion when we can see both in the sky at the same time? What is the object in between that could possibly be shadowing this moon and she's like nothing this must be its own thing well yes it's its own thing so she has the logic and the understanding because she hasn't been told lies that it's in the earth between the sun and the moon how can the earth be in the sun and the moon and see both in the sky i mean it's that simple but people can't see because they're blind right the plum bomb the sextant astrolabe the geodetic the pascal vases gyroscope sundial Theodolite, compass, I'm not going to go through all these. I'm just saying that we've done laser test levels, <laughs> all of these, planosphere, they're all proving we're not moving and there's no curve. So there are formal, lots of formal experiments that were done, have been done, that were excellent. Two that I'll mention are Aries failure and the Michelson-Morley experiment. Basically, you should be able to detect movement it somewhere, okay? We're sophisticated enough in our science to be able to design some experiments to sort of figure out if we're moving relative to star patterns, or in general, we should be able to find some sort of evidence of movement. But these two experiments proved no movement whatsoever. Then George Sagnac's experiment, he forced that notion and then throws out the theory of relativity, but the universe do not have these in their curriculum. Or if they do, they've altered the data. So I remember learning Michelson-Morley, but it was denounced after. So they'll say it and they'll say, but it was, it, somehow it was disproved or some other fake scientist or ghostwriter scientist came in and said no. And then that's what you get as your conclusion and you don't question it further. Some physicists in the field who have worked over 25 years have not even heard about these experiments and that should speak volumes in and of itself. They, why hide the information? Why not talk about it openly? What's so wrong with having an open conversation about these things? Why you got to get your panties in and not for it? Why you got to get so angry, right? What's oh, That's a clue. If that happens, then we have propaganda and censorship at play here. That means they're hiding something because if you really wanted to do science and know, then this these should be open, debatable questions that aren't, you know, re resorting to ad hominem attacks and all kinds of stuff that happens. But that's not taught and it's not even allowed. Or if you start asking those questions, good luck getting your dissertation done or getting that lab job that you want with that professor because immediately you are going to be discriminated against and ostracized. And that's how they keep the lie going, guys. Like this is how it, in the university setting, you, it's a cult. You don't question that because you don't get the benefits that come with, you know, nodding and smiling and doing everything that your professors told you to do. It's not a free thinking world. The, the universities threw out, threw out free thinking long ago. All right. It's a leftist cult agenda now. It's like, oh, fake climate change and save the world from racism and whatever. And like making more problems and being emotional infants. You know, that's the, that's universities now. I wouldn't even send. I said to my daughter, I said, I don't think I don't think you're going. <laughs> I think that era has passed. OK, we will have to make our own universities anew, just like all the systems which are failing us now. But I suggest that you look up these experiments so that you understand them. They're basic papers and and very eye opening. The gyros as well. That's proving that airplanes travel over a plane and not a sphere. So this aircrafts use these to determine their heading right so what they do is they hold their orientation in space independent of earth position or what they call gravity or whatever if the base of the mount of the gyro mount is rotated the reading should indicate how much rotation has occurred now i have a video that i can share with you guys later 
that they used a commercial directional gyro used by aircrafts and placed it on a flat table in a location in the northern hemisphere at 53 degrees latitude and waited for a sufficient period of time to see if the earth rotation was registered. There was no registering. There was no movement. Okay, again, very simple proof. You should be able to register movement happening. We should, by all intents and purposes, be able to rise up an airplane or a helicopter and just wait for the earth to move along and go away and the country you want to go to show up underneath and then land, technically speaking, right? But people will come up with all sorts of, even I remember, what did I think when somebody said that to me? I think it was something like, oh, well, the atmosphere rotates too. So now I had to make something else up to, do you see? I had to manufacture something to try to make that proof. That's not scientific, you know? Oh, how do we know? It Really? Do we know that? How do how have we been able to show that with science? We haven't. There's no proofs of that. It was just something that, well, well, then it all moves. You know, the whole air moves too. It does? Okay. So, so, but air goes all, but wind, like, okay, no. <laughs> how? Doesn't make any sense. Gyroscopes, vision instruments, consisting of a wheel mounted inside two or three gimbals, which provide pivoting support and allow the wheel to rotate about a single axis. As the entire contraption moves and shifts angles, the gimbals move and shift accordingly, but the inner wheel never changes its angle with respect to its initial reference frame. This unique property is called rigidity in space, meaning the inner wheel maintains its orientation and axis of rotation in relation to space and not to the surface of the Earth. This means that the base of a gyroscope set in motion with its axis in a vertical position, then placed on a table for six hours, should rotate 90 degrees with the spinning globe Earth. As the globe turns under the gyroscope for six hours, the axis should slowly turn from vertical to horizontal. This experiment has been tested many times with several full-length videos available online and never does the gyroscope's vertical axis shift whatsoever. If the heliocentric model were true, not only would the gyroscope detect the alleged 1,000 mile per hour spin of the globe, but also the 67,000 mile per hour revolution around the sun, the entire solar system's 500,000 mile per hour spiral around the Milky Way galaxy, and the entire galaxy's multi-million mile per hour journey through the universe. Since these hypothetical motions never register on precision gyroscopes, it is clear that they, just like the spinning ball earth they're based on, do not exist. Gyroscopes are also the technology behind inertial guidance systems and airplane artificial horizon indicators. When military jets are performing loops, barrel rolls, and other dogfighting maneuvers, the artificial horizon allows pilots to easily see their exact orientation relative to earth without having to rely on looking out the window. If Earth was truly a sphere, by simply flying level, airplane artificial horizon indicators should show a steady decline unless pilots constantly correct their altitudes downwards so as not to fly straight off into so-called outer space. For example, a pilot traveling 500 miles per hour over a globe Earth 24,900 miles in circumference would have to descend an average of 2,777 feet, or over half a mile per minute. Otherwise, in one hour's time, the plane would be 31 and a half miles higher than desired. In fact, if Earth was really a ball, there should be no reason to use rockets for flying into outer space, because simply flying an airplane straight at any altitude for long enough would already inevitably send you there. Okay, so Foucault's pendulum as well, people will bring that one up a lot. So, okay, there's the video I mentioned. So Foucault's pendulum, they say, oh, they pushed this and now it's it's showing the movement. So it's stable and then it slowly goes and it's, so it's showing our movement. That's where they're, that's their proof. But in the 1850s, they tried to repeat this experiment. That's science, guys. You have to have a repeatable experiment to prove anything. You can't just do a one-off and say that's the case. And all kinds of inconsistencies. You, it would go different ways. You could stop it. You could, it's almost like the same thing as the toilet flushes this way in one hemisphere and that way in the other. No, it doesn't. No, it don't. 
Nope, it doesn't. It's depending on the manufacturer of the sink or the toilet that which way the water goes down, guys. It's, it's nothing to do with spinning. <laughs> but all they have to do is tell you that in school with someone who looks professional, with someone who looks nerdy enough or looks like they're in a position of authority and people just, oh, okay, that's it. Or Star Trek told me, so that's true. So they made it all up. And this is where, this is why when people say, what's, why is it so important that I understand this? It's because of all of this. This is how they've controlled our beliefs, all kinds of beliefs, DNA beliefs, satellites, viruses, the two-party system, evolution, aliens. Where do aliens go from outer space now? Gone, gone. As soon as somebody tells me there's aliens from outer space, I'm out. I don't need to waste my time with that now. I know that's automatically bullshit because that doesn't happen. Nothing can get in or out of this place. Money system, oil. Oil is not from fossils of dinosaurs, guys. Okay. It's the blood of the earth and it is renewable resource and it is endless because it's literally mama's blood here. So just like universal water or endless water. We have endless water as well. They try to tell you things are limited so they can put fear into you and then control your, your spending habits and your basic lifestyle. And that's the goal. So it's all lies. And once you realize that, it starts to really open for you. They l love to show these really fancy images of Mars and all these planets and tell us all these details about it. Like, wow, did you know there's actually somebody named a moon crater after me, you know, and this kind of shit or, and, oh, did you know that Mars is this cold or this hot or has this much rock or look, actually Marty Leeds was really helpful for me to help understand that the above the firmament. Okay. And there's a waters above, it says in the Bible, waters above and waters below God separated the two with the firmament. And he put the stars in the firmament for time. So the, all of the, this is a sky clock. This is to helping us tell time and seasons and planning and knowledge about ourselves. It's all there, but that is the in between the spiritual heavens and us. And the spiritual heavens is non terra firma. It is not the material world. We're in the material world. That is not the material world above us is non-material. It is either it's a guess because we're only going to be able to guess. Okay, but we know again what it's not. It cannot be material matter. Impossible. The things when we look at all of these planets, they are, they shimmer, they move, they are a bio photoluminescent. They are like what it says in the Bible anyway is that the word of God, the spoken word, so vibration, and was what stimulated the light. So this is how it got started. This is in Genesis. Genesis is all full of flat earth information and truth information. But those who are Christian or those who, you know, read the Bible or need Bible proofs for themselves, like the religious people, it's all there for them, you know, in, in 66 plus books of the Bible as well as the removed books as well. And that's what it looks like as shimmering light. They are lights and the wandering stars are considered more influential upon our persona, upon us. They have their, they bear influence. And a lot of the cultists actually worship them and do sacrifice to them. So we don't even know what that is. Are they demigods? Are they just what it looks like when we pass on? Is that what we return to? I always had this feeling like we do return to stars. Like our canopy above us is like one of us each is a star. And that's what we look like when we go home sort of thing. This was just an idea I had you know, for many years. And it was mainly after a Joni Mitchell song, like we are stardust. Right. And I was like, stardust, how, like, what does he, what do you mean by that? And I was like, oh, maybe we are that maybe that's us when we leave the corporeal realm. I don't know. It's just an idea, but what if these are beings and we can't see them with our current perspective, with their current limitations, right? Why did they sacrifice to them? Why did they pray to them? The there must be some reason or rationale they're doing that. So, but as I said, this is all guesses, but we know what it's not. And it's not terra firma. You cannot land on it. You can't land on Mars. You can't have a rover on Mars. So this is what I was saying about timekeepers. So they are timekeeper planets. I mean, we lost the technology to go to the moon. Don Pettit literally like retarded. He had, like, I'm not making fun of his mental capacity per se. I'm saying that he's not very smart man. Okay. If you ever heard Don Pettit talk, 
he he's slow he's a slow guy and i and oh there's a hole oh well we'll just we'll put duct tape over it like that's what he said when somebody said oh what happens when you get a hole in outer space oh we just deal with it like what don't you think it would be called death <laughs> if there was a hole in your spaceship <laughs> they're liars and he's an and when you have eyes to see you see what a joke how they make fun of us that's the thing that angered me a lot i was like they make they don't hide it and they make fun of it they make fun of us not getting it they mock us all the way through they mock us and when you finally pull the shroud away you can see how they make fun of us this is a photoshop image that they said was from the moon and if you actually adjusted the levels in photoshop you could see that they just did a click of an image over another image that's it very easy to prove that they faked that all of that moon landing stuff and but now we're on mars all of a sudden i mean they've already proved this is where arizona or some part of the desert where they're they actually have the rovers which is their testing location yeah okay no that's their filming location for fooling you nobody's on mars I get this proof a lot. So Earth is too big to see in your curvature. This is the problem, right? So it must be, it's too big. How can you see the curvature? This is a common argument. But then they will say, when you say, look, the ships go away from your eye, but then with a zoom lens, you can bring them back, which means they're not going over any curve. Well, they'll say, but they'll say the ships have disappeared over the curve, but that's a very close, that means that ball is not very big right? If you can actually see a ship disappear. So they get caught, people will get caught in these conundrums of ideas, right? About their claims and they contradict themselves. And this is a common one that's done. All Masons, all of these people that you, that they put in your face with all the stories, all the back stories of who they are and all the pictures, which are never real pictures, obviously they're all artistic renderings. Do they, did they really even exist? We have to even ask that because most of history has been manufactured at least, you know, well, there's been at least a hundred years it's been manufactured in the literature, in the literature, like Huck Finn and all those stories. That was all backstoried in as we lost a bunch of historical time. And who are these Masons? Well, they give it away. They show you who they are with their symbols, right? These were all the people who decided the earth was a ball here all part of the Masonic Lodge, all part of the big cult. And that's George Carlin said, it's a big club and you ain't in it. <laughs> now the ancients, they do a lot to, to denounce our ancestors, to say that they were stupid, to say we came from cavemen, that we were brutal imbeciles, which I think there was, I think we've been brutal in, imbeciles now. <laughs> but before the Great Reset, before the last reset, we were brilliant. It was a brilliant place to, to live and to be. And the technology was incredible. We had free energy. We had everything. I mean, look at the Tartaria information, if you're interested in, you know, learning more about that, because that's the sort of the inroad to some of that information. But Egyptian, Norse, Hindu, Mayan, Inca, Navajo, Hebrew, they all have a firmament, a flat plane, an above and below aspect underneath. So maybe that's the hell realms or whatever they're talking about or the great deep is what the Hebrew cosmology talks about. God above, it's always an above and below. There's a lot of talk about large turtles being the base or larger animals being part of our earth basin. We have evidence actually of giants of that of back at the beginning where everything was big. Everything was huge. The trees were huge. The plants were huge. The insects were huge. Everything was huge. This is how they faked the dinosaur hopes. They took the huge bones and made up something else, made up another fantastical story, took the bones away and hid that history and truth from us. And there was a gentleman that I met in his story, his YouTube is called Stellium 7. And he was hiking, I believe. And he was like, this is a weird, what am I hiking on? And he looked way back and it's a giant elephant. It looked like a giant elephant. He's like, this is too anatomically correct to be a coincidence. And so he went in and scientifically studied this mountain and proved without a shadow of a doubt that this is a giant, was a giant elephant. Eye structure, trunk structure, everything. Impressive, right? So we have, we think we know, we don't know what the heck this <laughs> kind of gets weird and I say to people, come to where you're comfortable. You know, if the, if you don't want to go down that, you, you don't have to, but you do have to know that the ball earth hoax is important because 
It means that you can better understand and navigate this place and stay away from the liars and hoaxers and con men. So there's your NASA picture. <laughs> oh, I just noticed someone wrote like twat and knob on it and <laughs> pong. <laughs> That's funny because they do, they have to paint it and draw it and they'll do like stamps of clouds. So you'll see like the same cloud repeated because they got lazy with the painting of it. And if you compare all the balls together, they all look different all the time. That's ridiculous. So they all had all these cosmological his history, historical knowledge, all had flat earth under a dome firmament, which there's question that there might be a dome and a firmament, two layers. There's some, when I did my Mount Miru summit, which was really awesome, that I talked about water in that summit, but, you know, one of the presenters was suggesting that maybe there's actually a couple of different aspects to what's happening up there, which is very fascinating. So see, it gets you into all kinds of other explorations of knowledge. So yeah, Bible, Torah, Quran, all contain excerpts that can be interpreted in this way. Sumerian, Babylonian, Vedic, Chinese cosmogony depict similar notions. So, so why do they have to do this? Do you notice this trend? Why ever, you watch, I don't watch news, I don't watch TV, but for those who do, it's in your face. You want put on a movie, immediately ball earth in your face. You put on the news, ball earth in your face. Everything you watch, ball up in your face, ball up in your face. And they always open their segments with this imagery. That's called programming, guys. There's no need for it. If everyone knows it's a ball, why you gotta keep shoving it in everybody's face? It's because they gotta keep getting the next generation. You gotta keep putting it as a normalizing thing. This is normal, this is real. The, all of the TV shows about outer space and you know, it's the same thing with the whole germ theory, right? They had to make contagion movies and whatever. And they blend truth and fiction in such a way that your mind and your imagination, they do, you don't really know. You don't know the difference, right? So it's like, it bleeds into your subconscious. It bleeds into part of your belief system. It's very dangerous to expose your children who are very open-minded in, in the way that they think to all of these images. And I was very clear at the beginning that my daughter would not experience television. There's a flicker rate, nervous system problem, of course, with it as well, but she doesn't need the programming. I don't need to go and we don't need to undo it anymore. Right now, we have to undo all this mess inside ourselves. So this is big work. But in our children, we don't, they don't need to go through that. There's no point. We can tell them the lies of the other side if they're interested. But really, we're focusing on not programming them from the get-go. <laughs> this is fun. I just put this in because it was funny because this is Copernicus, right? And he was actually, there's stories and rumors that he was actually an imbecile. And he was sort of mental. And he would write crazy stories. And he came up with the ball of earth as one of his crazy stories. And the queen took the story from him and then they made him into some sort of fluff you know front man picture and it was nothing based on science it was just he was like a madman who came up with some idea and they're like yes we're gonna work with this this is good we can do this we can lie to everyone yes this is convenient just like they when they manufactured the germ theory it was all political it had nothing to do with health or well-being or any of that they didn't care about that they wanted to control people and how are they going to do it well hey you can you prove that there's an invisible particle coming in and hurting you no you can't you have to rely on experts same thing with this you have to rely on experts who have telescopes or have all kinds of gadgetry that something is true or not so you have to appeal to authority they want that because then you are powerless and you don't know the truth this is this is the only black hole a mass has ever found <laughs> the money pit here they are thieves, they're liars, they're con men, they're frauds. That's what they are. There's nothing to respect about it. They are the uh, space propaganda arm NASA for the military industrial complex created mostly to militarize space, scam the American taxpayer out of billions and wage war on your mind using scientism and pseudoscience. That's NASA, not a space agency. Okay, so this was the big one for me. When I was trying to go and click in my head this stuff when I was still fighting and I was still calling my friend that he was mental this did it for me because it was more the emergency landing on airplanes that really set it in but I started studying the different maps there's all kinds of different maps there's no one right map <clears throat> everyone will say oh you know the azimuths equidistal equidistance map that's the best one or this is the best one I don't think so I don't think we 
quite have it. I think the closest we have is the reverse moon map that that has been presented to us that is showing a snapshot of this place on the moon front. So whenever the moon was formed, it was like a snapshot of all the land masses were imprinted upon it. It's like a picture. It's like a silver, you know, like an exposure, an exposed picture. I think that's the closest map we have is actually the moon, <laughs> the image of the moon. And if you do it reversal, you get, it's really profound. And that means there's a lot more land. Wherever we are, they're hiding a ton of land. That's why we have an Antarctic treaty that pro prohibits people from going to certain places. We had people historically that went to Antarctica and found warmth and warm hot springs and beauty and growth and life. And that's very hard to find that information now. There's, I know there's a book about an explorer who did that. And, but these routes for me sealed the deal. These make no sense. On a ball of earth, the way that the planes fly make no sense. Why would you go up here to Europe to go across to North America if you're like, why would you go like this? Why wouldn't you go straight? Don't you have only a limited amount of fuel? If you want a direct flight, unless you're doing stopovers, I'm not talking about stopovers, I'm talking about direct flights. Why are you going all over the place? It doesn't make any sense. So that sat with, I sat with that for a while. And then I did the mapping out on the maps that we know are close enough or what we've been able to determine are close enough to land masses because we can measure the land masses. We can drive and measure and drive and measure and drive and measure, right? And yeah, oh, these are the straight routes. Oh, straight route, straight route. Okay, oh, interesting. But when I read the emergency landings, where they would land, it made absolutely no sense. How could they? There'd be a woman pregnant giving birth. They had to land immediately. They didn't have time to think about their hopes. They just had to land. And why you land, so you're going here, why you landing up here? Well, that, that's weird. So for people who are having a hard time, that's a really good place to study to really just help pull out of it because it was a big, that was a big one for me. That helped me a lot. And of course the Bermuda Triangle mystery has been solved because they don't go to space. They just, Send it up and go, whoa, oh my God, oh my God, everybody. <laughs> you know, and then where does it go? Well, it goes down to the ocean. <laughs> and then the other cockpit, which is an airplane, they just fly back after. That's their hopes. That's the... Watch any launch. Just watch what they do. Study it, you know. Study what shots, the cuts. Very telling. When you have eyes to see, you can see how... They just switch to another camera, switch to a different CGI green screen. They never show you a full, I want the, I don't want interruptions. Just show me it, go to space. Show me, go, but they don't do that. It's always cut. All right, what's it going to be? A galactic farce for Christopher, an exoplanet for Otis, and not a nebula for June Marie. And listen, NASA's got a new one today. What is it? This is called a scamdiddlyumptious bar. A scamdiddlyumptious bar? How does he do it? My dear boy, do you ask how they fly in a vacuum? No. Or why they Photoshop Earth? No. No, sir, you don't. They do it because they have to and know what's best for you. NASA was born to be a scam man, but you look like you were born to be a scammed man. Who can take the sunrise and say it's you who truly moved? Cover up their screw-ups with a murder, maybe two. Or three or four. The NASA man. The NASA man can. The NASA man can, cause he lies, he cheats, he scams, but for our own good. Who can take the night sky and drape it in a lie? Polish up some mirrors and say that they see back in time. The NASA man? The NASA man. The NASA man can. The NASA man can cause he lies, he cheats, he scams, but for our own good. The NASA man creates pictures that are fake. The ones of Saturn seem suspicious He puts the stars as far as he wishes And makes new words for unreal distance A Who 
who can take tomorrow and come up with a scheme? Flying planes much faster than we thought with the jet stream. The NASA man. The NASA man can. The NASA man can. The NASA man can, cause he lies, he cheats, he scams, but for our own good. And who can make a chemtrail crisscross way up high? And call it global warming when it heats up in July. The NASA man? The NASA man. The NASA man can. The NASA man can, cause he lies, he cheats, he scams, but for our own good. Who can talk to Nixon? Hello, Neil and Buzz. A quarter million miles in the sky. I'm talking to you by telephone. Two second delay, but from the ISS it's five. The NASA man? The NASA man. What is the ISS position right now? The NASA man can cause he lies, he cheats, he scams, but for our own good. Eleven seconds. The NASA man creates geocentric coordinates. Stationary tastes delicious. The spinning ball is pure fictitious. Astronauts are having green screen glitches. Who can take a rainbow? Make it perverted, not divine. But who can be inclusive and hire that new guy, Caroline? The NASA man? The NASA man. The NASA man can. The NASA man can, cause he lies, he cheats, he scams. But for our own good. So we should believe we are spinning. Cause the NASA man says we should. Here are your con men. Now, you know, I don't really go, I don't touch the whole Jewish thing much, but they are, we're all Jewish, all of these people. I think more so the Zionism aspect, the non, not really Jews, they're not really Jews, they just Jews in hiding. So whoever these people are, they formulated all of their colonization in this way. So these were the movie makers. Here's your MGM, Fox, Paramount, Universal, Warner Brothers. You've got William Fox, Marcus Lowe of MGM, Adolf Zucker of Paramount, Carl Lamel, Lamley of Universal, Jack Warner Brothers, and William Fox of Fox, obviously. So these are your madmen. These are the people. It doesn't take a lot. People think, oh, it's so big. How could everyone be in on a hoax? They don't have to be. There's only a handful of megalomaniacs that came up with such an idea that continued to move forward. It was the same thing as the Jekyll Island situation with the Fed, right? The Federal Reserve creation. It's exactly the same thing. They met in secret. They had a plan to take over. And it's not very hard to figure out. And it only is like a handful of men. And then the agents of deception uh, that keep the lie going, Aleister Crowley, occultist and ceremonial magician, Jack Parsons. He was the founder of JPL, a, a Thelemite occultist, Ron Hubbard, L. Ron Hubbard, American author of science fiction, which is how they injected it into the culture of ideology and belief systems. He founded the Church of Scientology, which is a cult. Walt Disney, American animator, film producer, and pedophile, founder of the Magical Kingdom. Magical. It's magical, guys, right? It's all a magician show. Arthur C. Clarke was an American the science fiction author who invented the idea of a satellite. Satellites weren't like, hey, guys, we really need some tech up here. We should figure this out. It's be a really cool idea. We didn't need any of that. We had undersea cables for communication. We didn't need any of this stuff. We have fiber optics. We don't need any of this stuff. We don't even need the wireless stuff at all that we have today, believe it or not. We have the ether. We can use ether to transmit. You don't need wires. But they came up with all this stuff to control, to make money, to keep people asleep, all of these things. This is These were the inventions. And he came up with the satellite idea. Same thing as with Queen going to Copernicus. They say, oh, hey, you got a good idea, buddy, bruh. 
we're going to use this. We're going to, yeah, man. Yeah, man. This is good. This is good stuff. Yeah. We can fool everybody with this because it's so fancy and so techy and so complicated. And you can get all kinds of people involved that don't know what they're doing. They can make a satellite. I'm like, I'm, I make satellites. I know they're real. Yeah. Do, where do they go? Do you go to the launches? Are you part of the, like, do you go and see how they put them up on the balloons? Yeah. You can send signals all you want. But guess what? Those fall down. We have evidence of those. Those do fall down. They eventually fail. That's all. That's the Starlink too, as well. I mean, you've probably many people have seen Starlink go up. They're all in balloons in a string. <laughs> Why didn't they just put them in outer space? Since it's so, you know, so floaty up there. And then Werner von Braun, German-American aerospace engineer and a pioneer of rocket science. He's your rocket scientist, which are not smart. So I, every time I say, oh, he, I'm not a rocket science, right? Not a rocket scientist. <laughs> like, actually, no, I take that back because I'm smart. So this is just the end here. I just said that, you know, if you don't know, it's really, are you able to form an opinion that's not really? I mean, you can form all kinds of opinions, but they're not going to be accurate. So why do we have this habit of forming opinions about something that we think we know when we don't? So we can't do that. So anyone watching this who hasn't studied any of this, you can't, you, no opinion then. Just what you do is if you're interested, go, I've given you, I haven't, this is my, not my goal to teach everything here. It's ridiculous. Here's a nugget. Here's a nugget. Here's a nugget. Here's a clue. Here's a clue. Here's a clue. Off you go. And all the wonderful researchers and presenters that have come and even you have interviewed like David Weiss, right? You can go to them then they will give you the details and you can get into the nitty gritty of it. I'm just showing you a little bit big picture here, but your ignorance doesn't make me a conspiracy theorist, okay? And that is a trap that we've gotten into where we think just because it's challenging us that somehow we have to speak to it. No, resist. Resist the forming of an opinion until you've actually been able to qualify the information that you're trying to put into your opinion. <laughs> I see that as one of the biggest bad habits of people to this day. All kinds of opinionated ideas all over social media that are bearing nothing of value, really, because they haven't done the work. Now, if you have, a, have an educated opinion, I'm all ears. The world, according to NASA, is turning at a speed of 1,670 kilometers an hour. That's faster than the speed of sound. This is what the speed of sound looks like. And we don't feel a thing. NASA also tells us that the world is orbiting the sun at a speed of 107,000 kilometers an hour. That's 88 times the speed of sound. And still, we don't feel a thing. NASA also tells us that the world is chasing the sun through the universe at a whopping 720,000 kilometers an hour. That's a total of 828,006, almost a million kilometers an hour in three directions. And still, we don't feel a thing.
this is what 7 kilometers an hour looks like. With all those big numbers NASA is giving us, if things don't add up, it's time to subtract. We are not moving. Just sit still for a second. You're not moving. You're not spinning around an axis at a thousand miles per hour rotating around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour, spiraling around the galaxy at 500,000 miles per hour, and shooting off from a big bang at 67 million miles per hour. You're not. You're motionless. You're just sitting there. Just sit still. What does that even mean, sit still? Think you could sit still with all those motions? Just feel like you're moving. Feel that? Same thing you've always felt? Nothing? Ever? Nobody's ever felt movement. Nobody's ever seen the earth move. Nobody's ever seen the earth curve. Maybe you just got fooled by some masons. Mark Twain said, it's easier to fool people than to convince them they've been fooled. That's why it's so hard to convince you you've been fooled. You can't possibly believe that you and the rest of the world could have been lied to and deceived by these masons. The oldest and largest secret society in the world, over 5 million members, all over the world, existing for hundreds of years, but not you, right? I couldn't fool you. Of course you're spinning around. Of course you are. That's what they told you in school. They don't lie to you in school. So there we go. And thank you for letting me go on with that. And I hope that was helpful. That was exactly what I asked you to present to us, which is really just an invitation to explore through these many different doorways. And I mean, there's as you were going through it, I was like, there are so many. <laughs> there are so many important entry points. And if you feel even a little bit intrigued or like a little bit of that, you know, rustling inside, you will be naturally attracted to the best resource for you. That's part of how this discovery journey works, right? Like there's unfortunately or fortunately not like a go-to text. And that's because this isn't controlled information, right? We kind of want like, oh, what's the textbook, you know, for me to learn all the things. But I think you pointed out what so many of us are coming to, which is the imperative to resist that logical fallacy, that burden of proof fallacy, right? Like you don't have to know what is. Just enjoy the process. It's and it becomes fun, right? Like I know you enjoy it too. Enjoy the process of like, oh my God, that's a lie too, right? Like initially the deception experience, of course, invokes a lot of the mother father wounds that all of us are still working on, right? Like how could it be possible, you know, that my reality is this constructed, that I have been lied to, that I am somebody who could be lied to, right? Like that ego blow. And then there comes a point where it's like, it becomes more of a game, right? And every time you learn about one more thing, it's just a new a landscape, you know, that open, like a vista that becomes visible. And the process of really crystallizing what is true I mean, I think, you know, you're somebody who would say, well, there's really probably like two things, you know, are true for sure, right? Like we're on a stationary plane and, you know, this isn't a ball <laughs> right? yeah. and like not a ton beyond that. It's all just enjoyable exploration. And so this was really intended to be that invitation for anyone who is at this point of feeling, you know, attracted to this level of inquiry. And I'm so grateful for your generous time and information and preparation. Amanda, it means a lot to me. Thank you.
Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, I'm glad we bridged this and we're fearless people, generally speaking, you know, because I was very hesitant to come and talk about it openly because I don't really, I don't need the backlash, you know, what we don't, we have to decide what we want to talk about, what we want to focus on. But when I think about health as a practitioner, as someone who's, you know, grown up with this awareness and knowledge of health, natural and so forth, it is important because you how are you going to be healthy and health is mind body spirit and live the lie that we're on a ball i mean fully and i'm very all or nothing in my way meaning i don't just want part of the truth i want to know and i think it's very potent when people it's actually very relieving as much as it can be disconcerting it's very, very relieving when you know because now that all the tricks you're really armed with enough now to be able to stop a lot of lies and tricks coming back into you, which is going to help your stress levels, which is going to help the way your mind works, which is going to help your health in general to understand that your cosmos, where you live and that there's a God or there's a, there's something that created this place. And it's, we're not just floating particles that just came from random dust. And, I mean, came from an amoeba and then somehow that became a frog and that somehow became a bird and that's gonna become an ape and that like no that's impossible ball, just like the ball right and when you when that's inside of you i don't know it's hard to describe but there's a piece Somebody there's a, it. Yeah. you know and i, I want totally that agree. for people yeah. i crave that for people and that's why you said at the beginning you know there is a timing and i would look through the lens of like nervous system healing and autonomic regeneration and expanded capacity right because when you are you know living in that random universe it's a very scary place you're arrested in you know stress physiology and you really can't even begin to capacitate the possibility that this is a safer place than you're feeling or you have felt that it is right so that involves like a huge transformation but what is on the other side of that is the same thing that's on the other side of germ theory and so many of these you know extraordinary paradigm shifts is like you know when you stop believing in contagion and infection i bet you felt a lot safer in your body, right? Like you were no longer scared of other people, no longer scared of random contagion, you know, sort of befalling you. And it's the same exact thing, right? There is some place that you get to and whether it's like, you're no longer worried about like meteors destroying you at any given moment or, you know, being honestly irradiated by satellites 24 seven. I mean, there's so many layers that are baked in that are incredibly paralytically fear inducing that just melt away when you stop you know believing in this and so holding that safety within yourself is something you got to be at a point where you're ready to do that right where you're ready to relax the fight or flight that this agenda really is intended to keep you arrested in so it's like a very personal metaphysical journey absolutely hey man you ever looking to flatter I mean, our eyes and experience tell us the earth is flat and motionless and everything in the sky revolves around us. But when we cease to believe our own eyes and experience, we have to prostrate ourselves at the feet of these very pseudo-scientists who are blinding us, treat them as experts, astronomical priests who have special knowledge only they can access, like the Hubble telescope. So by brainwashing us of something so gigantic and fundamental, it actually makes every other kind of lesser indoctrination a piece of cake. Earth being the flat, fixed center of the universe around which everything in the heavens revolves gives a special importance and significance not only to Earth, but to us humans, the most intelligent among the intelligent designers' designs. By turning Earth into a spinning ball thrown around the sun and shot through infinite space from a godless Big Bang, they turn humanity into a random, meaningless, purposeless accident of a blind, dumb universe. Mm -hmm. So it's like trauma-based mind control beating the divinity out of us with their mental manipulations. Uh, people are always asking, you know, why do they do this? I mean, this is 
I mean, other than the obvious profit margin motive, NASA being the biggest black budget black hole in existence, sucking in over $30 billion taxpayer money for the fake moon landings alone. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, hundreds of billions of dollars, and not just NASA, but RASA and all the other fake space organizations around the world giving CGI images for hundreds of billions of dollars. So this modern atheist, big bang, heliocentric, globe earth, chance, evolution, paradigm, spiritually controls humanity by removing God or any sort of intelligent design and replaces purposeful divine creation with haphazard, random, cosmic coincidence. And so by removing Earth from the motionless center of the universe, these masons have moved us physically and metaphysically from a place of supreme importance to one of complete nihilistic indifference. If the Earth is the center of the universe, then the ideas of God, creation, and a purpose for human existence are resplendent. But if the Earth is just one of billions of planets revolving around billions of stars and billions of galaxies, then the ideas of God, creation, and a specific purpose for Earth and human existence become highly implausible. So by surreptitiously indoctrinating us into their scientific materialist sun worship, not only do we lose faith in anything beyond the material, we gain absolute faith in materiality, superficiality, status, selfishness, hedonism, and consumerism. If there's no God and everyone's just an accident, then all that really matters is me, me, me. <laughs> so they've turned Madonna, the mother of God, into a, the material girl living in a material world. Their rich, powerful corporations with their slick sun cult logos sell us idols to worship, slowly taking over the world while we tacitly believe their science, vote for their politicians, buy their products, listen to their music, watch their movies, all sacrificing our souls at the altar of materialism. <laughs> I 
set you free from all those lies. You'll be amazed with your new eyes. There'll be no fear inside your mind. A deeper meaning you will find. Won't you listen to me? I want you to see. I'm dying to set you free. Cause when you open your eyes, you realize that there's so much more to be seen. Just give me some time to blow your mind. I want you to see. What I see Give me your hand and hold on tight I'll take you to a place so bright Then you will finally understand The beauty of this wonderland Won't you listen to me? I want you to see I'm dying to set you free Cause when you open your eyes you realize that there's so much more to be seen Just give me some time to blow your mind I want you to see what I see Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it and find it useful